What's up, everybody? Squaring Around is proud to be in partnership with Elite Sports. We got our own stuff on there. Check it out, EliteSports.com forward slash square. You can also check out the full line of products they have supporting Texas State athletes at EliteSports.com. You just code square at checkout. Tired of winning the tailgate but losing the games? We can't help that. But we can tell you what the hell is up with each team and what's going on across sunny San Marcos. Texas State fans, get on your feet. You're listening to Squaring Around with Jacob Rodriguez and Andrew Zimmel. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode, a rousing episode of Squaring Around. I'm your host, Jacob Rodriguez. That is the Texas State Sports Press, Andrew Zimmel, and this is... Is the Republic of Football Podcast Network Texas State version or Texas State Eras Tour version? Are you sick no of that? Kidding, dude. Are you sick of that? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm I love not sick it. of it. We're Swifties. This is a, Sw- a pro Swifty podcast. Pro Swifty podcast. No, it's like I don't care. I mean, I don't listen to the game with the sound on anyway. So when they're cutting the Taylor Swift, I'm just making up my own fan lore in my head, being like, yeah. And then she saved that Bosnian like church. Remember that? So I'm just <laughs> making up my own like lore in my head about Taylor Swift. So I, I don't do- really care. I don't care either way. Besides, like, uh, Aaron Rodgers calling Travis Kelsey Pfizer man or Mr. Pfizer <laughs> on the Pat McAfee show yesterday, another headline I saw was Taylor Swift goes to the Jets game to bury the Taylor Swift jet controversy thing. I thought that was funny. So this is, like, super mega brain Swifty because they were, like, she was getting so much beef about, like, her private Jets, so she went into a Jets game to have it, like, the SEO, like, change. Now, the real question is if she comes to the Vikings game this week because she could put all that aside if she comes to the Vikings game this week in Minnesota because then it's like, well, you know, she's just... New man on the Minnesota around. Vikings. I know, man on the Minnesota Vikings. What's funny is that, like, the Vikings players, from what I have, like, listened to and, like, read, they are so ready to beat up Travis Kelsey. Like, they are more ready for this game to, like, they physically... Get completions downfield, and they're worried about Travis Kelsey? Yeah, exactly. The defense is. The yeah. defense cares. They, they want to beat up Travis Kelsey, which is funny. I'm like, why are we so... Patrick Mahomes might be the best player of all time, and we're, like, worried about the tight end? Like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Is he well? He only had like six receptions for like sixty yards or whatever. Not not that I pay attention that I had money on that game or anything like that for everybody at home. But uh, yeah, it wasn't really much of a threat, and that's why Aaron Rodgers called him Mister Pfizer Man. Whatever. Yeah. Which uh, let's stop there. Let's go. The guy who's getting money from Johnson and Johnson, literally Woody Johnson. Yeah. Who will not get to play because he has a torn Achilles that he says he's coming back from. Yeah, he's not coming back from. It's funny. I was talking to another person about this, and I said I cannot wait for him to like look like a like a snowman moving in the backfield. Like he's gonna look so bad trying to run around with no fucking Achilles. So good, good luck to him. You Mm -hmm. know, I tell you, you don't root for injuries, but for that guy, man, I make an exception. I hate Aaron Rodgers. (laughs) I really do. I really hate that guy. He owned the NFC for a a long time. So I no, he didn't. He didn't own shit. He didn't know anything. He owned my di- he owned he my division. Chicago. He owned my division. He did not own the NFC. It was the the whole Des Cotton moment that was through Green Bay. Yeah, you hate him too. Mm-hmm. The failing Green Bay Packers and now New York Jets. Mm-hmm. Get him out of here. <laughs> well, talking about great offenses, we are talking to the architect of Texas State's what I'm calling the Super Cat offense. Uh, mm. Mac Leftwich, which I was blown away that we could even talk to him because he is the brains of this operation, created this in the lab, UIW. Uh, that's like a pretty cool story, too. Um, you tell me that Lindsay Scott Jr. wasn't the brains? Huh? You tell me Lindsay Scott Jr. wasn't the brains of the operation? Well, he it was like, it was his fifth stop, right? It was his <laughs> fifth stop, and then he gets handed this beautiful playbook by Mac and company. I think Mac Leftwich, when he leaves, because I think he's going to get a head coaching <laughs> job here pretty soon. I think that he needs to leave the uh, the playbook with uh, with he's Lindsay so Scott. Many, so many preseason and probably even postseason accolades at this point. <laughs> the Bobcats are four and one, but he's, he's thirty for he's thirty under thirty for twenty four seven, and then he's forty under forty for Dave Campbell. So go figure. 
And he's probably 50 under 50 when it comes to play callers at the next level. Cause I swear, Easily, I, yeah. I, I look, I look around and I go, okay, I yeah, know we need to start the money pit for not only buying players through NIL, but to keep the assistant coaches around because that guy, he, him and I, people are talking about Kenny leaving. I'm more worried about Leftwich leaving. I don't yeah. want Leftwich to leave. The guy with the book. It's the, 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 the Bobby Boucher thing, you know, where he has the green little notebook. Yeah. <laughs> He's got the he's got the Ark of the Covenant, bro. He's got yeah. the tablets. Don't let that guy leave. <laughs> so yeah, no. Shout out Left Witch. Thanks for doing the interview with us. And uh yeah, I think it's pretty good. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Squaring Around. We are proud to be joined by one of the men behind the high flying offense at Texas State, whose father was behind the men at UTEP, who made Aaron Jones, Aaron Jones, uh offensive coordinator, Mac Leftwich. Thanks for joining the show. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate you guys having me on. For sure. So, what have you been up to this week? Oh, just getting ready to uh, getting ready to win another game. So, a lot of work goes into the prep preparation, a lot of film uh, wash, but uh, just got my haircut done. You know, just to to come on the podcast. So, uh, slowing things down a little bit. You know, had to had to had to look good for the appearance. It'll be on See national it. TV too, so that helps. You know. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's a good point. You, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's been you. I was gonna say you, you're the first uh, person who was like, we're doing a video podcast, and you're like, yeah, no, I gotta look good for this. The first video podcast we did, Jacob didn't tell me I was eating a hamburger on air, like while we were doing the podcast, and everybody was not, they were not happy about me eating French fries. Uh, it was like right. a mukbang video. <laughs> it looked, it looked rough. It looked rough. Uh, all right, coach. To this point, you guys have the number one offense pretty much in the Sun Belt. You, you have consistently been able to put up points. I said before the season that the Sunbelt defenses were going to be a little bit better. I was like, there's no way they put up 50 points a game. Well, we're on track. So what is the defenses like? What is the dif- difference being from the FCS to the Sunbelt now when it comes to like looking at defenses and scheming things up? Is it like the same thing? Um, Yeah, I mean, de- you know, it is it, it's been very similar. Um, You know, I think the, the coaches in this league and, and you know, we were one game into the Sunbelt schedule, so we got a long way to go. Yeah. Um. But, you know, I think the coaches in this league and, and the teams that we've played so far have done a great job. Um, you know, you see a little bit maybe more complex schemes, uh, a little bit more variety um, at this level. And then obviously just the um, kind of, you know, your your overall uh, level of player talent level that you're going against is is a little bit better week in and week out. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, football is football and it's a numbers game and there's only so many things that you can do. So uh, we just try to focus on the execution and, and get our guys a a sound plan that's going to work against whatever the defense shows and um, allow those guys to go out there and play fast and play confident. What's crazy is that I've heard that now, let's see from four or five different coaches and you guys are the first coaches that are making it work on the field. So I don't, I, I want to know what the secret is because there is like some little bit of coach talk. Okay. We put the best guys on the field, but there there's gotta be something else behind there. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, our, our system has a lot of, you know, we're not, we're not super complex offensively. Um, you know, we're not going to have a million different plays, a million different formations. Um, but within all of our plays, uh, we give the kids a lot of freedom. Um, and so they're making high speed decisions out there. Uh, a lot of our receivers, like when we're calling a pass play, they might have three, four or five different options on, you know, what their route could end up looking like, you know, based on what the defense does. Um, and so I think just, the way that we coach, you, I think we have a we have probably the best offensive coaching staff in in America. I think all the assistants do a great job um, getting those guys ready to play and, and play at a high level, and um, just really instilling instilling the confidence in those guys that that hey, we're what we're doing at practice. That's all you have to do on Saturdays. Go execute the way that you execute in practice, and we're we're preparing you. We're giving you the looks that you're going to get. Um, you know, you guys are all great players. Go go make the plays when they're there on Saturday, and and so far our kids have have done a good job of that. Do you think that there's like something to be said about the chemistry from taking a lot of the offense from last year's incredible uh, in- incarnate word team to like bring them to Texas state? Because, you know, we talk about all of the transfers and Texas state's one of the, the biggest transfer schools right now when it comes to people coming in and yet there hasn't been any real chemistry issues. There's not a ton of like offsides early in games or even early in the season. Do you think that chemistry is like really played a part here? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think, I think especially up front, I mean, that's what, you know, we go as an offense, you know, as, as our O-line goes. So if those guys are playing well and we're able to establish the run and, and have kind of that physical aspect um, and, and get the tempo going and stay ahead of the chains, all those kind of things, you know, we're going to we're going to be able to kind of get it rolling. And so, yeah, I think bringing those guys over from from UIW and, um, you know, our initial day one starting lineup, you know, had four guys that 
that were with us uh, were with us there at Incarnate Word. So, so not missing a beat and those guys being familiar with the terminology and how it's supposed to look at practice and what the tempo is supposed to be like and all those things I think was, was huge. And, um, and I think the other guys have done a great job of buying in. And I think, um, you know, we do a, a good job. The culture, you know, coach Kenny is great about um, the, the buy-in from the players, the relationships, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I think that's kind of why you probably haven't seen some of the, maybe the, the, uh, the growing pains or the miscues that you might see from, you know, a team with this many new pieces uh, elsewhere. Well, and what I'm worried about, not worried about, but we're in the middle of the season. I tell everybody just enjoy it one game at a time. Cause you don't know, like Mac, you don't understand the pain that this fan base has been through here, man. Like this is a, this is a very like distraught fan base. So for this to be, to be even be four and one at this point is like the pride and joy of the Hill Country. Like there's nothing higher than what we had. And honestly, I want to say from bottom of our hearts as fans, thank you. Thank you for putting a product on the field that we can get excited about, man. Cause it's, it's been tough. It's been a rough <laughs> couple of years. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. No problem. Well, we're hopefully we can keep doing that. That's, and that's, that's always the challenge, right? When you, you know, you take over a place and um, like you said, there hasn't been necessarily a ton of success um here in the past and so uh you know just getting those guys to be able to handle success and uh and focus one game at a time all the coach speak that you get right it's a one game season you got to go one and oh all that is really true you know if you start looking ahead and you start patting yourself on the back for being four and one um you know you can get humbled real quick so you know we've been been really uh locked in on on this week and on a great opponent in ul so um it'll be another good challenge for us but yeah that, that's been a challenge for sure is keeping these guys um locked in and and hungry for more you know not being satisfied with being four and one trying to go five and one so with your dad being a coach is it just natural like hereditary to get into the coach talk because i know some guys that go from players to coaches and it takes a little bit to learn like the coach speak was it just perfect for you you became like a coach and you're like oh yeah i know this is second nature yeah i've been watching press conferences since i was like 10 years old so it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty second second hand uh or it's, it's pretty fluid now you know well can you talk about i guess like seeing the game through like I guess like sort of like your dad's lens too, because you and GJ Kinney's story kind of like intersects when your dad was at Tulsa, right? Like how how was that? And like can you just talk about that relationship and like how it was kind of forged back then? Yeah, it was, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, I was a sophomore in high school when uh, when GJ was playing quarterback, and and I was only um, or my dad was only at Tulsa for, there for that one season. Um, and had a great year. You know, GJ ended up winning, I think, Conference USA Offensive Player of the Year that year. Um, we went to the Hawaii Bowl, which was a sweet trip for me as a sophomore in high school. I love that. Yeah, um, so I was so I was pretty so I was pretty thankful for Coach Kenny back then throwing a bunch of touchdown passes and I got me some surf lessons out of it. Um but uh, yeah, no, that was cool. You know, I'd always go to practice and and um, Coach Morris, uh, Chad Morris was offense coordinator at the time. And, you know, he'd always let me kind of hang around the quarterbacks and, and whatnot. And um, so me and, you know, as I got into coaching and, and Coach Kenny was in coaching, right, we kind of um, we connected and, and weren't super close by any means. But, you know, I had talked a couple of times here and there, um, you know, just from from that time back in Tulsa. And then, uh, you know, with him getting the job at UIW, it was, it was just kind of crazy how everything aligned and, and, you know, he ended up um, interviewing me for the offensive coordinator job last year. And, and you could tell, I think I, sp I think we spent like an hour, an hour and a half together watching film. And, um, you know, we were, we just, you knew we were on the same page and speaking the same language and, um, and, and could kind of feel that the, the chemistry was going to be really good. I, I'm totally stealing this question too, from the, the play callers podcast, because like yeah. um, that, season at UIW almost didn't happen or was it close to almost not happening because you were in Pullman for a while right with Eric Morris <laughs> yeah I went up to Pullman for two weeks um you know it was kind of one of those situations just uh coach Morris had gotten the Washington State job um and we had just got knocked out of the playoffs and and you know he he basically you know he said hey he called me or told the whole team you know hey I'm leaving I'm gonna go take the offense coordinator job at Washington State um you know, and he was a, he was a great mentor for me for those four years. Loved working for him. Um, and he calls me. It's like two a.m. Uh, two a.m. After I mean, we just gotten beaten in the playoffs. Our head coach tells us, you know, he's leaving. He calls me at two a.m. that night. He's like, "Hey, I got a um, quality control job for you at Washington State. Are you in? Like, I need to know because the plane leaves on Monday, and this is Saturday." And I was like, "Well, I need a job, so yeah, I'm in." And so I spent two weeks up in Pullman, um, you know, with Coach Dickert there and the staff, and and that's a great place. Uh, but which is just everything worked out with, you know, not having to move. And I, I loved my time at UIW, um, getting the chance to be an offensive coordinator, which is something that, you know, I wanted to do and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, getting around GJ just kind of, um, you know, I mean, everyone can kind of see he's he's 
the real deal and and is, a, is just a, a good person a good guy to work for so all that kind of stuff just you know led led to me staying two weeks so that's just enough time to start looking for apartments or are you going to live on campus because what no, i'm curious was, about is that security deposit <laughs> yeah no i was looking for apartments and and me and my wife were kind of freaking out because uh you know moving moving her and uh two dogs uh across across the country in the middle of the winter and you know it's like do am i driving the u-haul or are you driving the u-haul because i can't drive a u-haul so and, and it's not gonna make it over the rocky mountains so there's all kinds of back and forth going on um but thankfully thankfully you know everything worked out the way it did only for you to say two weeks later <laughs> unpack we're yeah. staying you know, yeah, you know what yeah. i'm gonna solve this u-haul we're, problem right now <laughs> yeah we're not leaving <laughs> so this is interesting because Jacob talked about like seeing the, the game through your dad's eyes and like through other eyes. What's it like seeing it between like Lindsey Scott Jr.'s eyes and now TJ Finley's eyes? Like when he comes over the sideline and talks to you about, Hey, this is what I'm seeing on defense. And when you're calling plays for, I mean, cause honestly, TJ is a completely, I, I think a very different quarterback than Lindsey Scott. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, skill set wise, they're, they're very different um, personality wise and the way that they approach the game and the, the mental side of things, they're, um, they're actually very similar. So that, and that's, what's been really good, you know, having Lindsay on staff. Um, I mean, those two have a, have a really good bond and, and, you know, I think, um, TJ, it's good for TJ to have Lindsay here and, and be able to talk to him and, and kind of, um, you know, be like a little bit of a mediary between the coaching staff and, and him. And, you know, he played in the offense last year, so he knows some of the ins and outs and, you know, there's probably things that, that Lindsay as a player did and thought about that, you know, I didn't coach him to do, or, you know, it was kind of like, little things that get lost in translation that made him so successful. And um, so I think he's, you know, imparting some of that wisdom on to, to TJ, which has been, been really cool to see, uh, you know, that relationship bond from those two guys. But, uh, but I would say, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, unique the past two years for me. So, because those guys, you know, TJ has been in college football. He's been at two different SEC places. He's, you know, he knows a lot of football. Like he's an experienced guy. Lindsay was the same way, you know, he was on his fifth school, had been in two SEC schools, the Juco Nichols had played in a lot of football games. And so those guys, you know, they, they kind of, um, they have, they bring ideas to you. They can really articulate, you know, what they're seeing on the field, you know, what they think might work, might, what, what they don't like about the plays that I'm calling or the plays we have on the call sheet, all that kind of stuff. So there's really good back and forth, um, you know, between me and between those guys. Whereas previously at, at UIW, I had two, um, I had played with two young guys, two true freshmen, John Copeland, his freshman, sophomore year, and then Cam Ward, uh, who's now at Washington State, his freshman, mm. sophomore year. And so those guys, it was like, you know, hey, this is their first experience in college football. Um, you know, let's not put too much on their plate. Let's be simple. The way, you, you know, when you're when you're, it's your first year and, and it's the first time you're ever seeing college defenses and blitzes and all this stuff it's a little bit different than when you're in year five and you've, and you've been around the sec and all that kind of stuff. So it's been cool to see, you know, the difference the past two years from my previous uh, four, I guess at UIW. And, and I've, you know, I kind of had a, had a chance to work with guys all over the, you know, experience level spectrum, but yeah, TJ and, and Lindsay are really similar, um, you know, mentally in the way they process the game. Obviously TJ is a little bit bigger, stronger arm, maybe, you know, thrower, maybe a little bit better. Lindsay's, you know, kind of your, your playmaker can, can run around and, um, and was obviously really effective as a passer for us last year. Well, no kidding. Yeah, right. Only 70 total touchdowns. I, I think <laughs> kind of effective is, is kind of missing words there. No, I mean, this is a, this is a team, I think, with, with T.J. Finley. When he came in, I think Jacob and I both were like, well, he'll be a good backup to Malik. And when he started week one, we were kind of both, Jacob, am I being wrong here? Am I speaking out of turn here? And it kind of felt like, okay, let's see what he's got. And then Ruined since then, all it's been, all right, take, here's the keys. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's 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 done a great job and and you know I think that's something, you know, as as you know, he's he's not been here very long. You know, he's he got here in July. Um and so just as we get to know each other as as we've, you know, gone through these first 5 games of the season, we kind of um get a feel for what he likes in the offense, what what he's good at, all those kind of things. And so, you know, it's kind of always an evolving um process, you know, trying to trying to fit the plan to to fit your quarterback as, as best as you can. And, um, you know, both those guys, Malik and, and TJ had a great battle in fall camp, both of them, you know, it was, it was what you wanted bringing TJ in elevated Malik's game. Um, and TJ kind of rose to the occasion and, and was his, you know, best version as well. So, um, been proud of those guys. It's been really cool to see too, like in the games, being able to get both of them in there and, uh, Malik having the success that he's had running the ball when he goes in. And, um, one of the things too, I'm just really proud about, or not, I guess not proud about, but it's been, um, it's been neat to see those two, like the dynamics in that room. You always worry with a quarterback competition, you know, about 
just the the animosity there and and both of them have been super selfless it was uh one of my favorite parts of the year so far is when um, we ran kind of like the little trick play and Malik and TJ were on the field at the same time and Malik scored and then you know those two are the first ones that meet in the end zone and celebrate with each other you know that that was a pretty cool pretty cool moment to see um you know I don't think you get that very often in, in college football at the quarterback position I think Texas State, whatever they have in the water over there, makes camaraderie a little bit easier because it's not the first quarterback room that's been like that where it's like everybody's kind of rooting for each other. And boy, does it make life a lot easier, I think, from a coaching perspective when it's like guys are not at each other's at each other's throat or, you know, talking during film sessions or something like that. So, I mean, look, I like it when they're both on the field, too. Can we get some more of those plays? Can we get more yeah, of we'll- the, when they're both on the field at the same time, coach? Yeah, we'll start. We'll start dialing them up. If you if you have, come up with any ideas, just send them over to me. We'll we'll, well get them in the game plan. You know what's funny is that I told uh, GJ that we would do it on Madden, and he was like, "Well, I already have the Madden playbook down." So I was like, "Okay, <laughs> well, a, I don't know how much a, more I can give to you." <laughs> he's already locked in on all the Madden plays, huh? He's locked in. Yeah, we had a whole convo about uh, NCAA, and he was talking about his like recruiting style in the game, and I was like, "Oh my god, he just approaches it the same way he does in real life." It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's nuts to be we, able to yeah. do that. Yeah, he, he had a lot of practice there uh, back in NCAA 13 and 14. Yeah, exactly. But what's interesting, so you talk about like being with young quarterbacks and being with older quarterbacks. And I think the way college football is changing now is that it's like almost a revolving door in a lot of these different programs where a young guy might come to Texas State and spend a year or two and then go to somewhere else or vice versa. A young guy goes somewhere else and then comes to Texas state from a coaching perspective. How does that affect the way you look at an offense? Because you got to think to yourself, like, okay, I'm in the season. I'm in the season. I'm in the season. Season gets done. Okay. Now I need to think about next year. Do you know, like how are those conversations go with guys? Like, Hey, I kind of need to know where your head's at so I can kind of start game planning for next year. Like what is those conversations like? Yeah, I think uh, a little bit of that for sure. And just, you know, I think that goes back to the relationship piece, just being close with these guys and um, then being, you know, feeling comfortable to talk to you about where they're actually at. And so you're not getting blindsided, I think is big. Um, but really, the really the way it kind of goes down is is we just go out and try to recruit the best players that we can get. And then in the spring, we're going to kind of run our, our base offense and install like that because there are certain things in our offense that we know, like, Hey, these are going to be, this is who we want to be. This is kind of our identity. And so that's what we spend a lot of the spring doing. And then, you know, as, as we kind of continue to recruit, cause there's still that, you know, second portal window. And once you get to the summer, um, you know, you kind of know who your team is, who your personnel is. And so then that summer, um, you know, summer coaches break when you're on vacation and you have a lot of free time, you're just kind of thinking that's, that's kind of when you start to dial in on, Hey, this, you know, these are some of the maybe unique pieces to the offense that we have. This is how we can use those guys. Um, you know, so early in the year, just, you know, kind of having an identity, getting good at your base things um, and and recruiting the best players that you can. Because at the end of the day, you know, if you got good players, you're going to have a chance to win a game, you know, win games. And so for us, that that was kind of the, you know, the the strategy this year. You're a huge tempo guy. I'm not used to you guys going as fast as you are. In fact, I missed uh... – Ish's touchdown when he had like a touchdown in the first like 10 seconds of the game against Jackson State. They're like, ah, oh, well, that's just what I'm never going to see again. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. But you got this year, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong too, Zimmel, but like probably the best quarterback room we've seen, best running back room we've seen, best wide receiver room we've seen. This is well, nuts what you guys are doing. It, and here's the deal it's, I don't know, I'm not going to say best from like a talent perspective, but it seems that you guys have been able to get the ball in guys hands like consistently and we made fun of uh, Hawkins here on this podcast because he was our player of the year before the season we were like oh this is a guy that we think is going to be like and I mean if you he's incredible but he's probably like the fourth name that fans are talking about right now you know what I mean and that is a true testament to spreading the wealth like getting as many guys involved as possible so how how does that go in the in the season like in the game are you like I need to get this guy touches or are you just like hey roll the ball out there TJ make the right reads, throw the right ball, like throw the right ball, the right place. Uh, probably a combination of both. I would say more, more so than not. It's, it's more of like, Hey, we're running these plays and based on how the defense reacts, you know, TJ is, is distributing the ball where it needs to go. And I think, like you said, it's been one of the things that has been good about us so far is the ball distribution has been really good between the running backs and the, you know, a couple of different receivers that we've used. Um, so, you know, I think that that makes us probably hard to game plan against because it's not like, you know, one guy is getting all the targets and if we can double team this guy or if we can roll coverage to this guy's side all the time, you know, then they have no passing game. And so having a couple different guys that you can go to and you trust 
um, you know, I think just makes you makes you harder to defend. But there are definitely times throughout a game, you know, hey, we need a big play right here. Like, and the good thing is, um, you know, I feel confident in, in four or five, th- six guys. Really, you know, when you need a play, that they're going to make the play, and that's, um, you know, that's a good feeling as a coach to have. Good, usually, good players make you uh, look like a good coach, and so we've got a couple of those good players that are that are making plays right now. I I just think that it's lightning in a bottle. I just I I want this to be a continual su- success. And I, I, that's the only thing that I'm a little bit worried about is that like, is it just like accumulation of everything? Like the offensive line from UIW, TJ Finley comes in, you know, uh, Ishmael looks one, like the best running back in the Southeast right now. I put him up against any other running back in this like area region, even like, it just feels like everything is mixing and matching at the right point. We're talking when we're four and one, you know, I'd like to be talking when we're seven and five or, you know, or seven win team or eight win team right now. And everything's working good. Um, but man, like I just, I'm really impressed by how everything has just kind of worked. Everything's clicked, you know, did it feel, is it feel easy? Does it feel like things are coming easy to you when it comes like the things clicking or is it like, no, this sucks. This is hard. We're working really hard over here. Uh, you know, it it doesn't necessarily feel like it's that hard of work. I mean, we definitely we spend we spend a lot of time, you know, watching film and putting together the plan. Um, you know, early. I mean, there's a lot of late nights. You know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday throughout the week. Um, you know, as we're kind of game planning and putting together all the different situations and all that kind of stuff. Um, but but I think this team is enjoy. You know, we got a bunch of good. Um, a bunch of good kids that, that want to win and are hungry. And so, you know, whenever that's the case and, and a great coaching staff, we get along really well together. Um, so you, we are working really hard, but it doesn't necessarily feel like we're just grinding. You know, it's, it's been really fun so far. And, and it's a, it, it, you know, shoot, anytime you're four and one and you're winning games and you're scoring points, you know, you're, you're, it's an enjoyable you know environment. So we got to keep it rolling. So four and one, do you feel like there's a target in your back? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're, I'm sure a little bit, you know, I think, um, you know, we'll go, we'll go to Louisiana this week and, and those guys will be ready to play. They'll be juiced up, you know, home game for them. And, and, um, so yeah, they'll, they'll be fired up. I think every, every team that, that we face the the rest of the way, I mean, you look at this conference, it's a, it's a really good conference top to bottom. There's no, um, you know, there's really no easy games on the schedule. If you, you overlook somebody or you don't prepare well one week, um, you know, you can get beaten. So that's, and I think that that's also good for our guys and good for us as coaches too, knowing that, you know, I don't think there's a, um, there's no complacency or, or a like, Hey, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty good. We've arrived type feeling yet. You know, it'll, it'll, we'll be locked in and, and we'll prepare like we have for, you know, these first couple of games. I wish we were playing. That's, uh, what, that's what I want to hear. That's great to hear. I wish we were playing you or ODU because that was like statistically one of your best games as a quarterback too at UTEP. That's kind of sick. It was fun to <laughs> yeah, be back in I, that I, kind of. <laughs> yeah, we got to get that back going. I didn't. I didn't. I. I. I, I definitely. Uh, I definitely called more passing yards as a as a play caller than I than I actually executed as a college quarterback. So my career is going a little bit better than it did as a player. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the creation of the offensive system. Before I do, though, I want to correct Zimmel. I will never disparage Ashton Hawkins' name. That's my ride or die on the team. The big games yeah, are a, coming. Stay yeah, he's a Yeah, he's a he's a dog. He's he's a great player. He, and you, we moved him. We moved him outside last week, and and you could kind of see some of that playmaking ability down the field and all that kind of kind of show up. So I, you know, I'm excited about what we got going on with uh with his role. Well, the I, offense I thought... has turned an entire state or entire uh, university to know the name Joe Dirt. So. I mean, I credit you for that, we're, man. Yeah, we're we're just trying to get him to to cut a mullet, and 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 then he's he just got to fully embrace the per, you know the persona. He's got to do oh, it. Yeah, totally lean into that. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I I probably made too many water boy references when talking about this offensive system, but like, when did you have your Mister Pat Coach Klein moment? You know, did you were you like, oh, this is like what I'm trying to do, or like this is like kind of the vibe I'm going for? When was that, or like when was the very beginning of it? So the very beginning was actually when I was playing at UTEP, when I first got it, like really excited about this offense or wanted to dig into it. Um, and obviously it's a little bit different now than then, but so we're playing rice one year when coach Bailiff was actually the head coach at rice. I'm a starting quarterback um, and we're watching film. And again, at UTEP, you know, we're, I think we averaged maybe may on a good year. We were like a 24 point, you know, per game team. Like we we're 22 personnel handing off power. And I was making all these crazy run checks and all, you know, under center all the time. And um, and we we play Rice and I, so I'm getting ready for the game and they had played Baylor early in the year when when Baylor was you know scoring 50 points a game they were throwing it around all over the place winning 10 games and so I'm I'm watching the the film 
And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so easy. These guys are running like five plays, and they're just running by people, throwing bombs. Like every run is a 15-yard run up the middle. Um, and so from from that point on, you know, just kind of the intrigue into that offense and the wide splits and the tempo and and kind of all those things uh, started and, and was lucky enough to get around some people who knew a little bit about that offense. And, you know, now Coach Shoemaker, our O-line coach, you know, he was – he was at Baylor at that time, so there's a lot of roots there. And um, GJ spent some time at UCF, uh, who had who had been running kind of the hypo version of that offense, um, which they do now at Tennessee. And so, um, yeah, the, so the the intrigue into the offense and like thinking, hey, if I ever got a shot, that was that's what I want to do. Started actually a long time ago, you know, when I was still playing at UTEP. Just thinking, kind of like, man, that looks like it would be a fun offense to to play quarterback in instead of handing off power under center every time. But the difference between those offenses and this one, and you gave it away earlier, is that the wide receivers in this offense run routes. There's like you four or five different route trees versus Baylor, where there was two route just, trees. Just go deep or stop. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Which yeah. So it, and the, and it worked for them for sure, and that because they had some some unbelievable guys and and all of that. But uh, that that's one thing you know. I think we have a lot of really good um, offensive minds in the, in the room, you know, coach Kenny has a NFL background, you know, my real kind of background in coaching is in the air raid system, you know, under coach Morris. And then, um, you know, coach Stutz has the, uh, the run and shoot passing game, which is, which is really interesting to learn about and, and implement some of that stuff. And so, you know, you kind of see some of the, some of our backgrounds in that sense, you know, come, come th- or shine through in the passing game a little bit where we do have a little bit more variety uh, than, than just like maybe your old school Baylor offense. It's the offensive Oppenheimer over here, man. Like this is what's going on. It's like the <laughs> Sam Marcus project, bro. This yeah, is crazy. It, yeah. We, we, someone, I was on a call some with, uh, with somebody uh, who, and they were saying that we need a name for, uh, we need a name for our offense. So maybe you guys can come up with, with something that sticks. I got it already. This is a super cat offense. The super cat oh. offense. Yeah. <laughs> I, Named I, after I, the logo, you know? Yeah. You got, yeah. You guys just uh, trademark that thing and, and you can oh. sell some merch. Well, you know, you guys already have the merch shop up and running. GJ was true. immediately was like, you know what we need to do? Hats. Let's get the hats going. <laughs> Take back Deon's, Texas, baby. Yeah, Deon's you got, got like the Santa's sunglasses. Over there now. got the hats, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, like, uh, being a coach's son, does your dad ever compare, like, your trajectory to his own, like, how he had to come up versus you? Like, now there's, like, TikToks of you talking about tempo, talking about coaching tempo, talking about all these things. Like, is he ever like, hey, what the heck? <laughs> I had a little, uh, little harder of a road. Uh, yeah, he he gives me a hard time. So he gives me a hard time sometimes, and and reminds me some of the uh, stories from early in his coaching career. But um, it's been that that's probably one of the cooler things is you know now that I've gotten into coaching and um just you know mine and his relationship is is really close you know and and he's just always a a person that I can lean on you know for advice and um so he's been that's that's been really cool since I've gotten into coaching just getting closer with him and and you know just we talk every, you know a couple times a week about um game planning the defense that we're seeing what everything that's going on so yeah that's he's he's been awesome that's been an awesome uh kind of you know change not change of events we've always had a good relationship but we've gotten closer since I've been a coach I'm jealous <laughs> Andrew's dad ruined his baseball career. That's why he's jealous. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, we could, I could go and talk to my dad about like, you know, radio stuff. No, that wouldn't happen. Uh, no, this is like, I, I'm, you know, 28 years old coach. This is uh, not the peak for you. Clearly, this is like a stepping stone somewhere else. I just hope that that stepping stone is back in the office uh, and, and <laughs> staying in Texas state for as long as possible. Because like, look, I, I'm a long suffering Texas state fan, man. And to have an offense that I can turn on the TV and be like, Hey, we might score 70 points or we might not, you know, we could win games is the more important part is just so refreshing. Like I, again, you, you were at UIW when you beat Texas state, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, You're lucky yeah. I didn't make a voodoo doll out of you. Well, I'm currently, I'm currently undefeated in Bobcat stadium. So we got Ooh. that going. Ooh, knock on wood there, dude. Yeah. Don't did anyone that. did anyone tell you on the sideline like hey we're like two points away from breaking the all-time program points record you guys try to go for that or like eh. no 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 nobody nobody let me know that but we should have we should have had it our guy <laughs> my guy pj had her yeah. broke a long run at the end we got called back for uh for holding so should we should have had it i, I think so what? too i was gonna say talking about long runs when uh when ish fumbled the ball out of the end zone what was going through your head there that was the craziest play of I think I've ever been a part of because we go from like third and twelve or whatever it was third and long 
and I'm thinking like, oh crap, here comes a blitz. TJ's getting a hit. I'm thinking we're about to get sacked at the one yard line or a safety. And then all of a sudden I see him kind of working the he does he doesn't get tackled and he kind of shovels it to ish. And then I see some grass. I'm like, oh, this dude's about to get a first down. I'm like, here we go, call another play. And then he's, then then Julian makes the block on the sideline. I'm like, oh, this guy's gonna score a touchdown. And uh and then the the roller coaster of emotions there when I see number seven tracking him down and and hawk the ball and it's like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me out of that. We went from like Lowest low to highest high, back down to low. Is, that was a great <laughs> play. Well, but I told we, people we, we definitely we definitely been working some ball security this uh, this week in practice. <laughs> that's, that's what we wanted. That's good. That's, that's what we want to hear. Oh, I was telling people because look, when when you have a big lead like that, and then it kind of evaporates a little bit, and then you win at the end. Conversations are had about second half defense. That's not your problem. You don't have to worry about that. But there are people who are like, well, Texas State should have scored more points, and I'm like, why? Like they they had a comfortable lead. Like just relax. And if you know, I think it goes through like goes through my head as a fan. And you can correct me here, but like I think that there's part of it where you don't want to show your hand. You don't want to be running like plays you could be running in week eight, week nine in the middle of a blowout game, right? Yeah, and and a little bit of it, you know, we, uh, you know, we. I mean, our goal is to try to score every every time we get the ball, and and you know, in a situation like that where you're you're naturally going to get a little bit more conservative and start running the football. Um, you know, we got to we have to execute better and, and we have to uh, just have a better plan for that. You know, that that's if that situation comes about that way, we can, you know, maybe get a little bit more creative in the run game with what we were doing. So, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a weird situation and a weird, you know, ending to the game for sure. Um, just all, you know, all the momentum kind of went went one way. Uh, but the defense came through when we needed them and got a huge stop. And then, you know, I was proud of those guys being able to finish and, and you know, get the when we needed a score to to finish the game we were able to do it and and um you know got the job done with a good road win so that those are always tough to come by and 50 always looks good on the scoreboard 50 never looks bad on the scoreboard 50 50 to shout out to coach uh coach the prado and and ish for for the the freebie touchdown at the beginning too special teams contributing to the 50 <laughs> burger that was nuts man it was a great game and to see that guy chase down ish i mean this is a really fast guy i told you guys i heard him before yeah, i saw guy, him in the first was, touchdown jackson state that, that was that was a great effort play by that kid awesome coach well it's been great to catch up with you just talk about stuff before you know louisiana you know so uh, thanks yeah. for joining us again man this is great yeah appreciate it it was, it was a it was a great time it was a fun one yeah i look forward to talking to you before the bowl game <laughs> yeah me too i'll definitely be back on before that one Squaring Around is proud to partner with Home Field. Home Field is premier brand for athletic gear. You can rep any team that's represented on the Home Field collection, not including Texas today yet. I'm still holding out hope. Use code SQUARE at checkout. Get any team gear. You can get the Longhorns. You can get the Tulane Green Wave soon. Texas State. Just saying. Just saying. Jacob, that was another great interview. Uh, Leftwich is one of the better coaches. We talked about it, 30 under 30, 40 under 40 on all these different uh, lists. This is a guy who's going to be a head coach at some point, and I'm really glad that we caught him when we did. We got lightning in a bottle with him as an offensive uh, head coach or offensive coordinator. You and I talk about like our own future all the time. And like neither of us are like very like this is like what we're gonna do, or like this is like the direct path I can kind of see. And this guy's got it figured out. <laughs> like Which, uh, be honestly, can I can I be He's completely 28, honest with you? by the way, everybody? Am I am I jealous? Hundred percent. I'm pissed. A little bit. A little like, bit. Like, why couldn't I have done this? You know? Where where's my success? What a, where's been, my I could have gone to UTEP, thrown the ball around a little bit? Where's my GJ Kenny? No, what's going on? So anyway, no, I'm I'm happy for him. I'm glad that things are working out for him. And it's funny now, Jacob, because he's 28, I'm 26. We're getting closer and closer. You're talking to coaches younger than us. It's getting it's getting there. I mean, well, it's, well, when we talked to Lindsay, like I think Lindsay is like 24, or 25. He's like right there yeah. with us. So yeah, like, hey, he's man, like he's, he's, he's like 25. Yeah, which is wild to think about. In our defense, though, like he did hold himself back in college, right? Like he would have already in the real world. If he wasn't an athlete, he would have been us already. He would have had a job. He would have been yeah. working this nine to five with us and Tom from accounting. So, you know, but no, it's I'm I'm that was a good interview. I'm glad that we talked to him. And it's one of those things where like the more you get to know the people who run your program, the better you feel about it. And this goes all the way back to when we interviewed Don it in during the summer, right? Like, you know, hey, this is the person who's in charge of the athletic department. This is before a game is even played, and he's talking about how confident he is. Danfis is the same way, you know, game hasn't even played yet. And he's talking about how confident he is. And now we got four games, five games under our belt and left, which is as confident as ever. So this is great.
that is nuts that Kelly was like, we're going 14 and 0 this year, and he might be the closest out of any of us so far to like our record projections. I hope so. I hope he's right. Yeah. So thanks again, coach. Appreciate it. Anytime we talk to one of these guys, I just want to run through a wall afterwards. So <laughs> I'm all BRB, gonna run through a wall. Welcome to Scoring Around. Mailbag edition? Reaction edition? What do we call mm. this? Uh, headline propaganda edition? It's funny because like you are very much anti-reaction podcast. You don't want to mm. you you're done on Saturdays. When that final like whistle blows, you're like, we're done. We're hanging out. It's football time for the NFL. Like that, that's your life, which I, I get. But you don't want the reactions, which is fine. So then we come and do the podcast the halfway point of the next week and we go, hey. What happened last weekend? Pretty crazy, right? Well, it so, gives no, you, it I gives think... you and me both time to digest things too. I think yeah. it's a nice little yeah. digestion. I get like, to talk you know to when when they didn't cover. Uh, I mean, we don't have that problem this year, but <laughs> in years past, like wow, I just lost my house and a home on that bet last week. What's nice now is that I also gives me time to text and talk to other some belt like media people who are covering their teams so then we all get together on sunday on like a text chain and be like okay what did you see what did i see what is this what is that type of thing so the conversation now around texas state i don't know if we want to get into it where they rank like with with the sun belt uh the conversation right now around the league is texas state might be the either the best or at the worst the third best team in the sun belt conference which is mind-boggling this is not something i don't think either of us thought was going to happen in year one um i think we both did a good job of tempting our ex or uh, tampering our expectations and kind of being like you know pessimistic according to some people but man oh man to be at this point right now two ga- two games away from bowl eligibility is just insane and they're like real about like what the things that they have to do right they gave up like 32 points in the fourth quarter <laughs> Pretty much alone uh, against Southern Miss. And they had the game pretty much wrapped up in a bow by halftime. And so that happens and they were like, yeah, that was kind of bad. We should do better at that. Why? It's it's a, it's a weird and yeah, let's talk Southern Miss. It's a weird type of spot to be in because on one hand, you don't want to run the score up against a team. Mm-hmm. You want to get second looks. You want to get guys who don't get a lot of playing time in there and see what they have. On the other hand, you don't want to give a team an opening to come back in a game because if you sit like... You know, I, I joked that TJ Finley probably could have sat the third and fourth quarter. But then you think like, oh, uh, you know, if he sits and then we need to bring him back. Now we're like resting him and now he's like rusty coming back in. And, you know, every possession matters in that fourth quarter. So it's just is a it's a lot. It's a hard it's a hard line to walk. And I thought that uh, GJ Kenny got away with one maybe on Saturday. Do you think yeah. would you agree might have got away with one? Something I've learned too, covering the basketball team and just having extended conversations with Coach Johnson is that in league play, like you really can't afford to not play. Like even if you do get a win, like it's it doesn't behoove you to be like ah, let's kind of just take it easy and you know get some get some uh, second stringers out there and kind of just chill. Because like truly, a real criticism of this team is the fact that until last week, they really weren't forced to play four quarters against any team that they had played, and like. People were talking about, like, we'll get to the mailbag shortly. But, well, let's be honest. Were we going to get that dub at UTSA? I thought so. I thought we had it. Frank Harris didn't come back, I think, for sure. But I think until then, it was always kind of like the bigger brother holding the football out in front of him, you know? One team's four and one. The other one's one and four. I'm just going to leave that. Yeah, revisionist history. When we go like, oh, wah, wah, wah. If, yeah, now that loss to UTSA now might prevent us from going to a nicer bowl game. Think about that. <laughs> we might go 11 and one. And then because we lost UTSA, who's one 11, we don't get to go to a nicer bowl game. Just remember that fans when we yeah. talk about UTSA. And truly like what a difference a year makes, right? Because imagine if we had beaten Baylor from last year and also UTSA from last year, like we would have been ranked at this point, right? And then Jackson State also from last year with Dion. We've been nuts. Like, we, would, we would have been top 15. Not a top 15 team. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. It would have been crazy. But here we go. So, all right. Let's, uh, uh, you know. Are you ready to dive into I, the mailbag? Or what yeah, I'm ready to go, go in the mailbag. Yep. I know all the answers. So ask the questions, maggot. This is from our YouTube, from our guy, Tasty Meat. Question. What do you guys think it will take for Texas State to make the move to a Power 5 conference? And how soon could you see it happen? Uh, this is not an uncommon what is this? thing that I've Larry seen Tice? on Twitter. Larry Tice? Are you t- <laughs> Larry Tice's burner account? Jesus. Uh, look, the way that the Power Five has really like changed 
changed in the past, like, I don't know, calendar year between the Pac-12 completely falling apart, the ACC adding SMU, the SEC adding Texas and Oklahoma, and then the Big Ten doing their moves. Like, you know, realignment is always going to be something that's going to be happening, I think. Uh, But for Texas State to go there, you're talking about, like, not only football being good, but you're talking men's and women's basketball being good, baseball and softball being good, soccer being like really good. And you're also talking about Texas state potentially expanding even more than they already have in the past couple of years. So I would say at the bare minimum, like we're talking like everything goes right. Everything happens at the right thing. You're talking 10 to 15 years. And the way that trajectory actually probably would be is I think that it's going to be like 30, 40 years potentially for Texas State to get to that point to be playing against teams consistently at the Power 5 level. Now, that's not to say they're not going to be as good at football as those teams. That's to say that like the athletic facilities and everything else will not be at that level just yet. I think they're good for the Sun Belt. I think they're solid for what they for what Texas State is, and it's getting better every year. But let's be honest here. It's not, you know, it's not TCU. It's not Tech. It's not Texas. Yeah, I I think we the entire program really gained a lot of like criticism for the speed at which they went from FCS to FBS, and it was kind of like, did you guys even win anything at that? I don't know. Whatever. We have two national national titles in the D two era, so that's fun. Uh, well, that but was like all, that was like also from a very long time ago. So like you know, like our facilities, we were still playing games. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but at like Rattler Stadium, like what is now Rattler Stadium, and definitely didn't have this new stadium with or without the track that's focused on ESPN still. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think for once I would like for the university and the team to build crescendo to a real nice point, unless we're getting paid a lot of money to do it. And like suddenly Texas State gets a law school and a medical program. Out of and it. I'm telling you, the, like, Andrew oh, well. Zimmel, the Andrew Zimmel NIL fund will get us to that point. Texas yeah. State's winning national championships in football. And we, we get some of these uh, teachers to get out of the teaching workforce into cybersecurity and tech. Mm-hmm. We're good to go. We, we, we can get it to that point. But right now, I, I'd say minimum 10, 15 years, more likely 30 to 40. Like if we're being realistic here. The Andrew Zimmel teacher to programmer transition. Yeah, dude, I'm going to teach those kids how to become uh, cyber security people. And we're going to just become hackers and just steal all the rubles. When Putin is trying to do one thing, we're going to steal all the money on the other side. This is from Twitter. And I didn't realize it until like I was going through our like notifications. I had you and I have been like built up a pretty good rapport like on game days now, like tweeting back and forth. Uh, doing different things on both sides, you know, sometimes when I tweet highlights and stuff. But we got a pretty good rhythm going on Twitter. So <laughs> I was talking about basically the broadcast feed, like the those guys from Southern Miss have families, have jobs. Credit to you guys. But they just didn't know what the hell they were talking about. They didn't even know GJ wasn't calling the offense. I was insulted. And so I, yeah, I literally quoted that. We were surprised GJ Kinney wasn't calling this offense. And then the Texas State Sports Network quoted or tweeted at us and said, if only there was an alternative. So is that your your pitch now is to have you and me call these games? Huh? Actually, yeah, I didn't know what they were getting at because I was like, do you want me and Zimmel to get on? Because we'll do it if you pay us money, too. We'll especially do it. Yeah. Well, and then, like, I, I think maybe they were saying that like, you could listen to Clint Shields and the uh, yeah, radio I think broadcast that's what on they the were actually app. getting at. Yeah. Which is completely fair. Clint Shields is a great yeah. job. He does a great job. Um, what am I going to do? I, sync my TV to their radio? Like, yes, you can do that. How do you, you can do that? Do that. You can mm-hmm. do that. Uh, look, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. If, you know, what you could do is you could pause your television and wait for it to catch up to the radio, right? So then you play it from there. Or yeah, you know, there's a bunch of different ways I, to do it. I'm a I'm a Gen Xer, Zim. That's not that doesn't keep up with my TikTok brain. You know, like what what am Gen I to do? Z. Gen yeah. Z, Gen Z, not Gen what's, X. Gen, what's Gen Z? X. Gen X is the generation between millennials and boomers. I'm a boomer, apparently, because I yeah, don't know. hundred percent. You're a boomer. I fought in the world. I fought in World War Two, guys. Sorry. You got cheese for brains. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the I... greatest generation. That's not boomers. God. <laughs> the boomers came crazy after over here. the greatest generation. Yes. 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 Greatest generation, boomers, Gen because X. Because they fought in World War Two. That's why they're the greatest generation. Yes. Yes. Band of Brothers. Yes, there you go. This is actually the first uh, comment we got on our like post saying to get comments. We actually have a lot of comments too because I actually 
for once posted more than one time that we're doing a mailbag. Uh, mostly because I do think mailbag episodes are campy and it could just like lend itself to like, yeah. is this? Is this I don't podcast? care about the matter. Give me or is the this po- our question. podcast. Keep it moving. Give anyway, me the question. Between two bears said Texas State Sunbelt champions in year one. We said it first. Just saying. True. They said a lot of things. This is right. fair. They, if they you did say a lot of things right. They, podcast, also- they basically call the entire Sunbelt as it is right now. They, but yeah, maybe they should start a Sunbelt pod because the Baylor pod has been rough. Yeah, they need to make some side money to do a <laughs> they did a good they do a good job on the Baylor but it's like you know they I, everybody comes in most optimistic that's where we zag you know just like being completely you just did your meta bullshit I'll do mine everybody else was zigging Texas State's going to be the greatest offense ever all this type of stuff we were on the other side zagging being like six and six let's keep the uh you know keep it down you know there's no way they average 35 points per game they're averaging 40 points per game right now so it's like you just keep those tempted, like keep them down, tamper yeah. the, the, the expectations. And then when good things happen, you're really happy. Um, you know, so that's just, we zagged, everybody else zigged and, you know, they're technically right, but you know, we're following them too. Yeah. What would have happened if they were, they said all that shit on our podcast and then we went like, Oh, and four, God forbid. And we were like, Hey, Baylor, what the fuck happened? And Dave Aranda yeah. beat the shit out of us. And now I guess they get one good win. Right. And now everybody's talking about extending Dave Aranda and all that stuff. No, no, they're not. They're talking about not burning down Waco. They're like, maybe we don't fire him this year. <laughs> uh, not related to anything on the field. This one's from Josh Clem at mm. JT0DD. Zuka like was the best burrito town place back in town. Yeah, best burrito town back place. <laughs> that was all over the place. Whatever. What is this? No. I, I have not either. Before our time, I've not, I've not been there before. I was gonna say, like, if you're arguing like burrito places in town, I mean, there's it's a burrito bunch of place. Yeah, that's the other thing. Like, burrito is very much midwestern. That's what caught my attention there, because you know, tacos are what a lot of people will have in Texas. Burritos are more, I, I think, I think midwestern because people talk about they have breakfast burritos up here, yeah, um, versus breakfast tacos in Texas. So, I don't know. That's Good. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. I'm from the Valley. So for the longest time, I refused to eat any Mexican food or uh, Tex-Mex, especially like north of New Braunfels. Or, okay, that's fair. Because I was like, I've been burned too many times in the past. I'm not going to go through this shit again. Uh, and it was a huge pain in my ass until I found Herbert's and a few other like nice places. Los Vega, Lolis, Wowies, uh, all those places. Great spots to get Mexican food. Herbert's is our favorite. I'll, I'll never, there. never take anybody but Jake up there. And I hate that people say it's mid. It's like, okay. who says it's mid? Well, it's I mean, my brother. See, that's dumb because you know who doesn't think it's mid is Shea Serrano. Our world famous writer Shea Serrano liked Herbert, so critically acclaimed. Yeah, whatever. I think so. I think it's great. Okay, next question. Back to on the field stuff. Will Texas State host the SBC championship, and why is the answer yes? So I, I'll I'll make the case for them hosting. So the the way you host is you have the best record in the Sun Belt Conference. The way that you do that is you don't lose to Troy in two weeks. You don't lose to Louisiana this week or Monroe or whoever. You have to pretty much go clean through Sun Belt West play. You look at the other side. JMU is probably the best team in the East from offense, defense, special teams, but they can't play in the Sun Belt Championship game. But Marshall's the second best. I think that they probably get a loss to either Coastal or JMU or somebody else on the East. The East is just insane. It's a gauntlet. So odds are you're going to have one or two losses maybe in the East. Texas State would have to go clean through the West. That is the only way that they probably could host. And uh, look, that's totally possible. That is a very real possibility. But they don't they don't have um, an easy path to do it, but it's a doable path for sure. What I've noticed uh, in my short time as a fully fledged Sunbelt journalist is that the East in ev- all of the sports like tends to eat itself like towards yeah, the end of the yep. season because like you're just fighting for seeding and stuff like that. And it, it gets crazy. Uh, I want to say Texas State always has kind of like an easy route to the championship. But if you look at the sports that we are very good at, usually – not too bad at all in all See, of those seating brackets. And it used to not be like that. It used mm-hmm. to be the East and the West very equalized. It used to be like maybe two or three teams in the East, two and three teams in the West. But now the East is just from top to bottom. It's just really freaking good. And the 
West, I mean, Texas State looks legit. Arkansas State's the second best team in the West right now. Yeah, and it's like, how. and they're not good. So, like, you know, what are we, where do we go from there? Like, how do we judge that? Quarterback, I, I believe, right? Uh, I know. Butch, Butch Jones' his whole career is riding on the arm of an 18 year old. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. We'll see how that works out for you. Uh, this is from our guy, Rocky Salinas, too, on Twitter. Does the defense concern you at times? We're allowing about 430 yards a game and to some not good teams. What will happen when the offense can't put up 50? The fast paced offense is concerning with our defense. We could end up on the wrong side of a high scoring game. Let me tell you, this keeps me up at night (laughs) for sure. So I'll make, I'll make the case that it does. It does not concern me because uh, Monroe, not Monroe, uh, Miss Southern Miss, we kind of let back in the game. So that one is kind of, okay, Nevada, they had a mobile quarterback. I think we were able to kind of clamp that down in the second half. So we learned at halftime to get better. Baylor, we looked great against. And, you know, UTSA's offense wasn't very good. We just, our offense wasn't very good either. So I think the defense is okay right now. I do think that, like, being an up-tempo offense, Getting off the field quickly on some three and outs is not a uh, conducive to winning a ton of games, but that hasn't we haven't hit that point yet. So I I would say my panic level and you know Jacob and I we we did this in college all the time with our our buddy Dan with uh, the panic level. What's the panic level at? I would say the panic level for me personally with the defense four seven not not even at a halfway point yet. I feel fine. Still very much in the yellow. Truly the only time I was actually worried because I I had already checked off UTSA as an L. So like whether or not we won or lost that game, I was like, OK, well, this isn't really going to define how I think about how this team operates. This doesn't but, affect the six and six, uh, the six and six podcast. Exactly. Um, but like uh, the Southern Miss game was I was like, oh, oh, no, <laughs> we might have some glaring holes. But I hinted at that with Scott, right? Like we had over like 70 yards and like penalties, I think both sides of the ball so it's like well yeah if your entire unit is doing that it's not good i mean that's offense and defense still but still if we can clean up the defensive pass interference uh, all that type of jazz then we'll we'll be a lot i'll feel a lot better but yeah i mean like we still have a good defense i'm not yeah, like not it, it's not like we have like glaring hole glaring holes it's not like some other teams like i'll be honest I thought this defense was going to be one of the worst in the conference. And uh, it's very much not that. It's actually one of the better ones in the West. So I, I think we're okay. Yeah. Except, and maybe we just have to see another mobile quarterback for me to like figure out if we can actually contain a decent running back. I think we can. We, but, we contain the super back. Yeah. That's true. And we commit, we contain the committee of backs in UTSA to like under 150 or just over 152. And those guys are supposed to be like all conference players, like all three of them. I think we're picked. Well, yeah. And same with Frank Gore Jr. Frank Gore Jr. is supposed to be an all conference running back. So, yeah. like I said, I don't think that like the mobile quarterback thing, that's going to be a problem. But how many mobile quarterbacks do we actually have in the conference? Right. Like how many guys are actually going to be able to bust off 100 yards and like yeah. 200 yards in the air? Not this guy actually from Louisiana that we're playing this week, GJ recruited him and he says he's one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. So, well, you know what that means. That means we have plenty of tape on him. Yeah, that's that. That's he's been watching this guy for a long yeah. time. Man. Yeah, he he knows the strengths and the weaknesses. Got insides and outs. Okay, this is from our guy Runner XC8, aka Alonzo. Uh, who do you want to see step up the rest of the season that hasn't been a major factor so far? Ooh, I think. Well, we haven't seen like basically any tight end help except Titus Lyons, right? He's like the only tight end. He's the walk on story from last year. Uh, and got a scholarship, and now he's basically playing all of the time. Uh, but in the offseason, we had gotten uh, Connor Fox from, was it Kansas State or somewhere over there, something purple and white, and a couple other guys that were like supposed to be good. And we really haven't seen much from that entire unit. In fact, when we're running like kind of those like tiny routes, you know, those like five slants or curls, unfortunately, mm-hmm. when we have to still, uh, we're having like, either Ashton or Joey Hobart or, you know, somebody trying I was to gonna say, dogs after cat. If, if you asked me this question like a week ago, I would have said, uh, I would have said Hawkins. I would have been like, we have not seen enough from him. And we honestly, we, we still, still really, really haven't. haven't. 
We still don't really have it. We've seen a couple drops. We've seen a couple of bad plays. And Jacob was like ringing the alarm bell after like week two. He was like, where is the problem? Why are we not getting him the ball? And I was like, oh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Now it's kind of is. <laughs> it's like we're, we're at the halfway point of the season. We should be getting him the ball a little more. Which is why I was so excited at Jackson State when I got that one touchdown he got. I was like, oh, perfect. Uh, but yeah, I mean, G.J. Kinney, when he got him out of the portal back to fully committed to Texas State in the offseason, he said Ashton Hawkins has the ability to be the number one receiver in the country. I still firmly believe that. I just think, you know, we're really like, are we really getting these guys down the field or are these more like 15, 20 yard passes, you know? Yeah. Which and what's funny is that like TJ clearly has the arm that like if he was given this is OK, people who need to step up injuries aside offensive line. Because this goes right into my point. If we had more time to throw the ball, maybe Hawkins turns into a bigger downfield threat. But he doesn't have a ton of time to throw the ball. That's why we kind of have to run these five-yard slants. Well, but then some people will be like, but Zimmel, what the hell? Ishmael Mahdi just got this award. You know, he, he's running like 200 yards in two games. How do you explain rushing, that? Rushing offensive line and passing offensive line are two different things. Yeah. And I think everybody he's, knows he's that. leading the nation in all-purpose yards, which is completely different too. You know, like because if you just take away all the yards that he gets – when TJ Finley had that one pass to him that was like behind the, the yeah, line, the and then 96 he took it all yard. the way to the house. And then, you know, that we, we all know what happened. He fumbled uh, basically yeah. in the end zone and they got that for a touchback. Uh, that hurt. And like I said, if you take that touchdown, that touchdown counts and he doesn't fumble. And we're, we're talking about like Texas state going up. I think it would be at that point, like 56 to 10. Yeah. That's not, that's, that's a, that's a game. Yeah. We're done. Um, so anyway, yeah, no, I, I think the offensive line, I know there's a bunch of injuries that unit as a group has to kind of step up a little bit, give TJ a little bit more time to throw Hawkins would be my other guy. Like, let's get him a couple more touches. Let's like second half of the season, turn him into one of the better players in the conference. That was actually a touching point this week is because they're only playing with two captains. Basically it's TJ and Brian Holloway. They're missing three. Um, so, yeah, they're just be like, we need other people in the room to step up at this point because we haven't had these guys in like two or three weeks in some cases. And yeah, uh, Raymond McCumber wants to know five games into the season. How many wins do you think we get? Also, what does Texas State need to keep need to do to keep GJ in San Marcos? This is also uh, a very common one this week. How do we start keep GJ? start it? Start a lottery. <laughs> start playing the lottery. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, play? I'm going to pull up his contract right now. Can you, can you pontificate? Yeah. And so the, the, the question is like, where at through five games, how do we feel? Well, Jacob and I thought we were going to be like three and two. So I'm feeling pretty good right now about like that take. Uh, But you know, four and one, I think (laughs) a lot, we're better than what we thought uh, in every aspect of the game. The next six games, I legitimately think that we have a chance to win all of them. I I think the Texas has a chance here to go undefeated in conference play. Now that's not to say they're going to go undefeated. That's to say that I think they have a good shot. Troy and South Alabama are the two games that I look at as the two hardest games on the schedule. South Alabama, the last game of the season, you know, they're going to want to throw a monkey wrench into everything and really like try to mess everything up. So, I mean, I, like I said, I think the last six games, we might go six now. I was, I was making sure that GJ didn't have like a, a den opt out in his, Thing that no he does have an opt-out i think i think i want to say the buyout is probably just like his thing for the year like 800 g's right that's wild Ooh, if see. you win the lottery that's tonight the cash out is 551 million you just start a bank for texas state i'm i'm i would like legitimately i'm telling you i would pay like you know make put some money in a trust fund live off that and then the rest of it would go to texas state and like building this athletic program. I would become like the Jerry Jones for Texas state. If I got, if I won the lottery, I expect the next day, Steve Trout himself to contact me <laughs> to be like, Hey, where's our love? But I've already donated so much money to par Nelson and the women's golf team to win a natty. Sorry, Trouty. I have to get it on the cheap. I got to get a natty ring somehow. No, it would be mine would be football. I think that would be that's the hardest one to win a national championship in. I would 100 percent put all of my time and resources in that. I'd be out there recruiting, too. I'd be going to high school football games across the state of Texas being like, come to Texas State, boys. You'll enjoy it. We've got a river. Hopefully you're swagged out and, uh, you know. Texas, Texas state, state gear. State. Take Texas back state Texas. Gear, exactly. Yeah. For sure, dude. I'll have a cardboard cutout of GJ. Me and him sitting in the stands. I'm just trying to make sure he doesn't have a buyout. I don't see one. Like, no, legitimately though, I would win. I would. I would bring some of the best talent. We're talking SMU, 
Mustangs type shit. Like dudes would be kids would be SMU. Going, if you want to talk about guys that we when you see more of, we haven't seen really anything from Bo Corrales. Remember that was like the big like, ooh, yeah. what could have been? But you know, he's a guy that's been playing college football for like six years now. He's kind of beat up. Yeah, no, no kidding. No, I was I was saying like kids sophomore year of high school, six foot four, running like four threes, rolled up in Rolls Rolls Royces. <laughs> Damn, who got that car? Is that a bobcat on it? The bag man. That's what my name would be. Anyway. My 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 vanity license plate would say bag man. If you're curious, eight hundred thousand dollars a year is what DJ's getting paid for. Uh plus and minus, like uh well not minus, but you know, plus like if we get different things. Incentives. Yeah. So like twenty five grand alone just for a championship appearance, fifty grand for the conference championship, a hundred grand if we make a CFP semifinal game. Yeah. Some of them are like, we're not gonna do that, probably. Uh you know, and others, you're like, wow, this is possible for sure. But it's good. You got to put it in there in case that the agent comes back and goes, well, you we went to the semi like semifinals. What's that buy in? Like, what's that a million? You're like, well, wasn't in the contract. Yeah, wasn't in the contract. Sorry. I'm just saying, if we get if we win a bowl game before UTSA, oh brother, it's gonna oh, be man. it's gonna be hell. It's gonna I'm be gonna hell those for those Alamo Audible people on the next day. Oh yeah, no. That that's the one reaction podcast you will be getting. Oh <laughs> yeah, you'll get that sa- the same day it happens. I'm gonna edit it that fast. I won't talk about GJ's contract until it becomes relevant. <laughs> I, I'm trying not to think about it. Our guy Alejandro Gonzalez from Twitter says, "What bowl opponent would you like to see the Bobcats play in? Like, a, is this a Texas school or is this an out state school? UTSA. UTSA. I oh, would man, that would be a bloodbath. I want I want UTSA." That's my number one. I want cool. them. I want them in a bowl game. I want because that would be for all the marbles at that point. That you throw away the five and zero. You throw away all the other bullshit. You throw, throw away, away the your losers. stupid rivalry shirts. Yeah, you you show up because I I don't care about a rivalry if I have a conference or a, a bowl game championship shirt. You know what Over I mean? You, you can have your five and zero. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that would be my number one. UNT would be my number two, uh, and then I think old school Sam. I would. Old school Sam, Sam Houston, Houston? State. Yeah. They're one in five. No, I don't want to. They're not going to make it. They're, yeah, they're not, not going to make the bowl. You're right. They're not making a bowl game. I'm talking realistically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I, I would like to see. I was going to go Tulane. I, they're, they're, everybody talks about them being the best team in the, in the group of five. I would like to have a shot at Tulane because I know that Tulane's players would not play and Texas State's players would. I know that <laughs> after winning the Cotton Bowl last year, they'd come into a, the Frisco Bowl or whatever we would be in and be like, I don't want to be here. And like opt out, and our guys would be like, "This is the last game we're playing. We're all seven year seniors. Let's play. Let's get a uh, Colorado and the two transfer state transfer schools no, going head to head. And schools Colorado I don't doesn't want, have a defense, so schools I don't want to see Colorado number one right off the bat. <laughs> don't want to see them. Uh, don't want to see them at all. Uh, don't want to see Oklahoma State. Don't want to see any. I don't want to see any Power Five team in there. Oklahoma State even good this year? They're they're not good, but I just don't want to play them because that'd be a lame game. Uh, no, I want I want another Group of Five team. I want it to be I want to play in the Group of Five Super Bowl. That's what, what if, I want. Because uh, I saw some pr- bowl projections. Because that's all anybody's talking about when your teams are winning, right? Uh, I think one guy had us in the Frisco Bowl against TCU. Yes. So, what if your that two be, worlds collided? Yeah, that would be tough. I'm telling you right now that the a fucking game for Texas State. It'd be a rough one. To go from playing in the national championship to playing in the Frisco Bowl for TC would be yeah. that'd be a rough. And that'd be a rough just one. Prime to be like, we should be somewhere else. We should be somewhere else. And we're just happy to be anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope Texas State would win. I'd root for Texas State in that game, but that would be yeah. that'd be tough. That'd be Baylor, tough. Re- redeem yourselves. <laughs> no, don't I don't want to see Baylor. I don't want to see Baylor. That's not what I the one team I want to see again is UTSA. So what is yours? What what did your top three be? No, I think those are pretty good. UTSA would be crazy. We got a bowl win over them. That would be nuts. Because yeah. then I could just walk around San Antonio in peace again. You know? I'm yeah, kind of walking of around like it. Obi-Wan Kenobi right now in the shadows, like, you know. <laughs> you got a target on your back. Mm-hmm. A, a huge one, honestly. I get it. Okay, cool. That pretty much wraps up our mailbag, but I did have one more because last week we were talking about the turnover items, basically, right? With the Trident mm-hmm. gate and stuff like that. I had a dream where Texas State had a Trident, or not a Trident, sorry, a turnover train horn, alliteration there. They played it in the stadium? Yeah, but like it, 
a player would have to do it kind of like a Mack truck, you know? Mm, so like they would pull, they'd pull it and then somebody upstairs would hit the sound effect button. Or you would do it on the field with like some sort of canisters or something, you know? Okay. All right. Maybe steam powered. A steam, a steam whistle. Yeah, maybe. Or you, you have like a little mini train and you get in there like a conductor. Ooh, yeah. Kind of something. I, I, I like that. I like that. Personally, more camp than mailbag podcasts are the turnover items. But, yeah. you know, I'll take it. I'll take it. Well, because I guess that would work better in the baseball stadium because they have a fucking train there and it's on the train tracks, too. So I, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, behind the curtain for me, Jacob. Okay. During this podcast. I don't know if you heard it, but they've had three trains that have gone by. No, that's that that's, just speaks to the quality of your microphone, sir. It does. No, it's it's insane. Uh, it's all hours of the night trains blowing by and it's same similar to uh, Texas State where it's not as quiet zone. So they blow that fucking horn whenever they feel like it. They have to blow it at every intersection to make sure that nobody's on the tracks. There is like eight intersections that, through this town. So they blow that horn eight times at one in the morning. It's rough. I feel like I'm the Blues Brothers, like when they have that train that goes through. I'm a soul man. Da, 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 da. Finally, Mustache Gate. Uh, my my girlfriend was at the Jackson Estate game, or no, Nevada, excuse me. Uh, and she was there with her friend Kate, and she got to sit in like the upper lounge because our friend Kate Connors is, you know, formerly on the team. So she went to go hang out with all the coaches and stuff up there with my girlfriend. My girlfriend meets Coach Trout, and she goes, hey, my boyfriend loves you. Just true. I love you, Coach Trout. Wild. And then wild, he goes, wild introduction. Then he goes, how is the mustache? And she has to disappoint him because that's the same day I had shaved it off. And he's like, you just missed it. So I've decided I'm growing it out every baseball season. Right around the same time we preview the team with Coach Trouty, I'll grow it out, and then I'll have it all through the summer to their uh, Omaha run. Good for you, man. I'm glad you're going to grow the mustache out. Yeah, um, it's a good look from time to time. It's just kind of a hassle. That's why I kind of had to go. I don't. I don't know why you got rid of it because like, oh, like Halloween's coming up. Can you grow it in the next couple of days? Uh, yeah, the free already, this is this is four days not shaving. It's pretty good. Oh yeah, you'll you'll get it back. You'll get it back in plenty of time. Yeah. Do you remember that the the Frito uh, chips? The Frito Bandito. Frito Bandito. Who's who's the SJMC professor whose dad like designed it? Todd Grimes. Tom Grimes. Yeah. Todd Grimes. Yeah. Tom. Tom Grimes. Tom. Pretty sure it's Tom. But yeah, his dad actually designed that. It's pretty sick connection. Did you, did you have a conversation right. with him about racism and uh, advertising? He was like, "Hey, you'd look exactly like this guy you used to see on TV all the time." <laughs> He said, you said El Chapo? They said, no. Uh, but the first time I met Tom Grimes, and this is before I had my first TV job, uh, I showed up in a suit for something for the star. And he was like, if I was a news director, I would hire you right now because you look so good in a suit. I was like, thank you, man. It's the nicest thing anybody said to me ever. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay. Move on. <laughs> LSU three and two, Texas State four and one. LSU is the only three and two team on the rankings. Should Texas State be ranked? Final question, Andy. No, they should not be ranked. Cat's uh, Corner was asking that question, and I had to chime in and go, "Eh, it I would like to think they could be, but probably not, just because of the national landscape of football." The yeah. best conference in the country, they're three and two in, and we're in the best group of five conference, and we're four and one. It's. Yeah. Apples and oranges. Now, if we're Duke, eleven, and, if we're eleven and one. Game ranked this year, you know when does that happen? If we're if we're eleven and one, that's when we start having a conversation. If we're not ranked, that's when it's like, well, hold on, win against Baylor, clean through the Sun Belt. You know why are we not in the top twenty five? But we will be if we're eleven and one. Yeah, cool. But firmly a six and six podcast. We're two games away from that. Yeah, that would be really cool to just to have that. Like, okay, we've made it. And like everything else is pretty much just frosting, at least for mm -hmm. us, not for the team, because obviously they have very high expectations of themselves. But yeah, for themselves, a lot of yeah. those guys, you you brought up injuries earlier. A lot of those guys are now playing, so those guys can come back. You know, because what's the point of having you know, uh, like a let's for instance, just say some guy who's like wasted a, a red shirt year, like a medical red shirt, you know, to come back if we're losing, you know? Yep. Well, and then the other thing, somebody made the point the other day. They said that we're past that four game mark where 
you know, you get to play in four games and then if you know, you want to get a red shirt, you can't play the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So we're at that point now where there's some dudes who potentially may not have been playing or might not play like this week or next week who are going to be upset because they're all transfers and they all want to play. Like, what is that? Like, how does GJ handle that, um, that pressure, those, those, those inner, inner team politics. So I thought these two road trips, the first to Southern Miss for conference stuff, and then this next one to Cajun Field, I'm pretty sure it's called. Mm -hmm. But those are two good tests for the Bobcats, both in conference. Just see what we got. See kind of like we're already dealing with a lot of injuries and stuff, a little banged up. Uh, you know, kind of see what we're made of. I, I really hope that they beat the hell out of uh, Louisiana because I don't think they're a very good team this year. I think this is one of the worst teams Louisiana has fielded since Texas State has joined the Sun Belt. So if we struggle, then that'll make me have a little bit of pause when we talk about Troy and South Alabama. But if Texas State does what Texas State has been doing, which is putting up 70 points, uh, then uh, we have no problem. Uh, it's just insane to me that I did not think they were going to average 35 and they might average 45. That's just really hard for me to wrap my head around. I think I texted you the stat the other day. It was like 42 or 43 that they're averaging mm -hmm. right now. And yeah, to boost that average, they need to score like 50 again and to continuously score 50 because if they have one game where it's under 30, it's going to bring them down drastically because everybody knows in statistics, means are sensitive to averages or averages yeah. are sensitive to high and low extremes. There you go. Yeah, there you go. You're, you, you were getting there. You were going to get to that point. Um, this, either way, if we go... Uh, bowling, if we host the Sun Belt title game, whatever happens postseason wise for us, this will be the first postseason you have I have ever covered for this team. I just realized that. Duh. I mean, yeah, that's that's yeah, no that that's no, no that's a no brainer. It's the first postseason game they'll ever have, man. Like that's crazy. No, and like I continue, and I think that that's going to be the message at the end of every one of these podcasts is that like enjoy this because you don't know when you're going to get it again. You don't know if you're going to get it again. I am just taking this all in every single week when we win, just enjoying it, enjoying it, enjoying it. And I like like last week against Southern Miss. I know Scott gave me some shit on um, on text messages, and he was like, you kind of zoned out there for a little bit. You weren't texting me when Southern Miss was putting up some points. And I was like, yeah, because I was doing other stuff. I wasn't concerned. I wasn't worried I was that tweeting. Texas State <laughs> – I wasn't worried that Texas State was going to lose. I was just like, yeah, no, we're going to – we'll be okay. I, I trust trust the process, trust uh, Coach Kenny. So, yeah. I mean, this is I like – rather than make mistakes when they're ahead too, you know? Like, you, know, <laughs> you don't want to make mistakes when you're – losing you know well yeah that's a, thank, thanks for that one that's like a colton mcwilliams like take right there i'd like to make mistakes <laughs> when we're ahead yeah i mean good good call good shit i mean yeah so i think we're okay i i'm not i don't put a lot of um i don't put a lot of stock in the fact that we gave some points up to southern miss in the second half when we looked as good as we did for the first true um yeah, man. I don't know. I'm excited for the rest of the, the way this is going to shake out. It's still kind of a dream to me that this is happening. <laughs> this is like everything I've ever dreamed of. And one thing I've noticed, like just covering the team, covering college football again, because I stopped covering all things sports, basically for work and stuff, post or pre transfer portal, pre all these NIL stuff, you know, things that make the world go round now in sports. And I've kind of realized that we're all kind of like one year away from just shitting the bed again perpetually. You know, like we're one coaching cycle. We're one recruiting cycle away from just being dog shit again. Everybody across the board, not just Texas State. Yeah, no. And that's, again, enjoy it while you have it. Like if you're having a good run like this, enjoy it because you don't know when it's going to happen again. And also, I want to put this out in the universe. Everybody's concerned about Kenny leaving. Nobody's talking about left, which leaving. You should be concerned about left, which leaving. If that happens, I if one of the if if Kenny leaves, Leftwich just takes his place. If Leftwich we leaves, Kenny has to find a replacement, and that will be a real test. That'll be like the same way that Don had his first test as an AD hiring Kenny, and he got a plus 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 across the board for the hire. This will be the first real test if he has to replace an uh, OC, and mm -hmm. I hope he doesn't. I hope that Leftwich stays here forever. We also are fortunate enough as a program to have uh, an assistant coach too, DePrado, Daniel DePrado, who's mm -hmm. so intense, man. <laughs> I've been around that guy. And just if you go back on YouTube on the athletics page, just listen to him at, at the different press conferences. Everything he says is so intense, so direct, uh, especially following a loss. Like if you listen to that UTSA one, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, I think either way, our program has a lot of good people in it. Um, but I want to keep them all. Personally, 
Mm-hmm. So start been, giving money. Keep going, guys. Come on. Get start some giving money today. KD's yeah. loving that. Danvis is loving to hear that. Yeah. And we're don- We're keeping money, too. If you want to support this podcast and get us to wherever bowl we're going to, donate today. Hit us up. No kidding. Thanks for watching, everybody. We ain't got no badges. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Better not come any closer. Thanks for listening. New episodes out every Thursday. Follow the boys on Twitter. Eat them up. Eat them up.